Well, uh, I guess you're all prepared. You're becoming quiet. <laughs> uh, so very good on your part. So we want to welcome you all to the Institute of World Culture, Santa Barbara. Uh, there is an Institute of World Culture in the Ukraine and in India. So this is the Institute of World Culture, Santa Barbara. And we're a nonprofit educational uh, institute. Uh, for the promotion of lifelong learning and uh, the brotherhood of humanity. <laughs> a lofty goal indeed. <laughs> uh, we stream our events on a YouTube channel, IWC in Santa Barbara, if you're ever interested. And you can see these programs. They're recorded and left on the YouTube site, so you can review them later if you wish to do so. <laughs> I'm Robert Moore. I'm the chair for this evening's event. Um, any if you want any more information about the Institute of World Culture, uh, there's some brochures back on the table in the back of the room, but worldculture.org is our website. So you can find out all, anything you want to know about us and what our programs will be in, in the future. <laughs> Of course, today the program is uh, the symbolism of Persian carpets. Uh, we've been looking forward to this for some time. It kind of fits into our theme for the year is interdependence, diversity, and imagination. So I think it'll sort of fit in to that <laughs> theme. <was> born into <laughs> uh, <laughs> The Institute of World Culture functions in terms of 10-8. Uh, in its Declaration of Interdependence uh, from 1976. And uh, AIM-4 will be pursuing this afternoon to enhance the creative artistry and craftsmanship of all cultures, but also probably AIM-1 as well, which is uh, to explore the classical and Renaissance traditions of East and West and their continuing relevance to emerging modes and patterns of living. So I hope that we'll be doing that a little bit. Now, uh, <coughs> our uh, speaker tonight is Michael Korsh. <laughs> He's the owner and operator of Santa Barbara Design Center on Olive Street. But uh, you may, like us, uh, be familiar with him with his program on KUIT TV, uh, where it's Design Santa Barbara. So that airs every week, right? Every week. Every, every week. Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Michael characterizes himself as a rugaholic extraordinaire. <laughs> uh, and he also has a motto, like the short time that I uh, met, made his acquaintance. I, I think he lives up to this motto. His motto is to live happily and spread joy to those less fortunate. Oh, oh well, there's my that. <laughs> you know, I guess it's simple, but you know, it could really be helpful in <laughs> determining how one should think and act. <laughs> um, just a few things about Michael. He was born in Iran. His father was an industrialist um, who built uh, buses. buses, but uh, <coughs> during the Islamic Revolution, uh, he lost all of that. And then there was the Iran-Iraq War, and his mother sold all her jewelry uh, to get enough money to send Michael to Germany, Hamburg, Germany, to make sure he was safe. And thank you to Michael's mother for doing that. <laughs> and uh, in Hamburg, he was with his uncle who ran a rug business. But in the mornings, he attended the University of Hamburg in physics. And then in the afternoon, he uh, helped his uncle with his business. Uh, in uh, 1990, he visited some cousins in Santa Barbara. And I guess he got enraptured. <laughs> yes. Six months later, he moved back. So he's a, like a lot of Santa Barbans, like myself, that can't imagine living anywhere else <laughs> than Santa Barbara. <coughs> um, so he'll probably tell us, but he believes that 
Rug weaving is the oldest art form. It is an art that really resonates with people. It's rich in symbolism and tradition and beauty. And also that rugs become family treasures that are handed down from one generation to another. So this is a, a something that weaves families and uh, cultures and countries together. Uh, it, oh, just a side comment, off in that direction, if you go through there, if you need a bathroom, it's through there. So a warm welcome to Michael Cole. <laughs> yours is really pop out. I'm rugaholic, really. Once you get the visa, once you get the dust of the rug up your nose, there's no way back. <laughs> it's the worst addiction. If you're not addicted, don't get into it. But if you do, you're lucky because it is the nicest thing I can imagine to be around. I look at these; they're like my friends. They're like I know them for so many years. And I was telling the doctor a few minutes ago. It's like you're looking into your past a thousand years ago, and you actually feel it. It's like being a deja vu for me at least. Mm -hmm. So, I was a little kid. My grandfathers were into rugs, and they used to give a rug as a gift in a major celebration. Like somebody's getting married, somebody buys a new home, they give him a rug to them. On one of those occasions, I went with him. I was a little kid, and he was walking, and there's all these Turkomans, and the Turkomans are... I was a little kid, I was scared of these guys, because they have this little straight jacket, and they go like that, and they have long hats, and in the middle of Tehran, this is very unusual. And they have one rug hanging here, one rug hanging on their shoulders, and they're walking around. My grandfather used to go to them, so how much is that, how much is that? He knew, he liked Turkoman rugs, because they last a really long time. And I said, why do you give the rug to these people? Why don't you give them money or, you know, give, send them to vacation? He says, money they spend next weekend. They go vacation and they forget it. That rug will be with them, their children, and their grandchildren. So they will always remember that. So, wow, okay, oh, that's very interesting. So anyway, that's my starting point. And then I went to Germany. My mom, God bless her soul. See, she bought my freedom. I didn't have to go to fight Saddam Hussein in that crazy war. So I went to Germany, I went to school. I used to work in the, I used to go to school in the mornings and in the afternoons I used to help my uncle in his rug business, which was prospering back then. And I learned quite a lot from him. I owe him quite a lot in that sense. Uh, I fall in love with this art form. It's uh, thinking deep rooted in, I think, every one of our souls. And I get into this a little bit uh, down the road. And I 
decided other trades. I did other trades. I did website development. I did uh, real estate flipping. And all of that is good and fine, but doesn't satisfy my soul. This trade does satisfy my soul. And I figured out, well, you live only once, do what you love to do. So that's what I'm doing. So that said, I was going to talk a lot longer, but any more than an hour, you're going to fall asleep. So I make this thing a little bit shorter. Don't talk too much. If you have any questions, we will do afterwards. And let's get into it. I wrote some stuff here, so I usually do it freehand. But since I wrote it, I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> it's about symbols. Symbol is a mark, sign, or word that indicates, signifies, or is understood as representing an idea, object, or relationship. Symbols allow people to go beyond what is known or seen by creating linkages between otherwise very different concepts and experiences. And those are some of the symbols that they are woven into rugs for the last at least 2,500 years. So those are just very few. and. Any one of those, they have a hundred different forms, which we're going to get a little more into them. So I want to talk about rugs before we get into symbols itself. Uh, first of all, all these rugs and carpets, they're mostly woven by tribal people. And tribal people are these people, nomads, that they live in the steppes. They have usually, this is before agriculture. So these people are sheep herders. They go in the summers to the lowland, and then they go to the highland. In the summers, go to the highlands. In the winters, they go to the lowlands and they graze the sheep. So women are the ones that they are artistic. Those are the ones they stay back, take care of the household, finances, kids, cooking, and all sort of other agricultural needs. And so most of this, majority of the rugs in particular, are woven by female weavers. And I dedicate this talk to all those ladies, they're my superheroes. <coughs> Carpets, in a broad sense, a quite essentially art form. The creators of the great majority of these rugs are women. I mean, like in 95% before 19th century are woven by women. Women is not only the weaver of the carpet, but also she is the artist of the carpet as well. So we are seeing in these carpets the work of women who were never formally trained as artists, but had a wealth of artistic imagination and fantastic ability in their hand to create these beautiful artifacts. The result is something special, uh, extremely special for any art historian or any person who loves art to look at. The art was passed down from mother to daughter over a generation, and each generation offers something new on the traditional themes, brought some new ideas, some new vibrancy, perhaps some new colors or a different motif to the mix. Over time, we see the tradition of women-generated art producing layer after layer of richness and beauty in the medium of the Persian and Oriental rugs. So this is one of the oldest art forms that exists. So it was uh, the women that actually start weaving, and I think all this is started because of necessity. So. 50,000 years ago, our ancestors are living in this cave, or if they had imagination, they had maybe put a hut together. They're living on this hard, harsh, cold, dry, or wet floors. So they decided to create something. And animal skin was a little bit precious because they could wear it and keep warm. So they decided to make fibers. And they wove this. And then over time, they decided, okay, so the fiber, let's make it a little bit thicker. Let's now we have a little more time. Let's put a little more color, make it a little bit happier, put some design here and there. But all started, I think, over 50, 60, 70,000 years ago. And those are women who did this. Men were hunter gatherers. They were out hunting. I don't want to say they did the dumb things, but the things that take less brain, men did. And then. <laughs> And then the things that was artistic and imaginative women did. And actually, women worked a lot harder through our evolution than men ever did or will do. So I appreciate that quite very much. So that said, uh, some of the oldest excavated fabrics have been traced back to civilizations that, civilizations that existed thousands of years ago. The oldest clothing item recorded is linen tarkon from Egypt's first dynasty approximately 5,000 years ago. 
So these are the things that we have in hand. That doesn't mean that the Egyptians didn't do clothing 7,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. But since they are fibers and they're natural, they degrade much faster in the nature and we don't have much evidence left. So you see if there is a carving in a wall, stone takes maybe 20,000 years to degrade, but clothing does much faster. I have a piece of uh, clothing actually from Egypt. This is 4,000 years old. I mean, think about it. To survive 4,000 years, that piece of clothing, how long or how hard that could have been. But we have evidence that they have been doing it for thousands of years. Pants found in Chinese tomb were made 3,000 years ago. They found Chinese silk. They found Suthian silk that they are 3,000 years old. So they wore pants 3,000 years ago. Probably they did 5,000 years ago. Why not? So I think the weaving goes way beyond what we have recorded. But simply just because they degrade, we don't have evidence of it. The oldest existing fibers for textiles were dated 34,000 years ago. And this is, again, the fibers I was talking about. They found in Armenia, and they did carbon dating, and that fiber was woven, was 34,000 years old. But then again, think about it. We think about 250 years ago, our United States became a country is a long time ago. Or Santa Barbara, anything is 100 years old, is historic. You're <laughs> talking about 34,000 years ago, the fiber is there. But they could have done it 100,000 years ago simply degraded and we don't have evidence of it. But I think we, these fibers are a lot older than we think they are. I've got some pre-Columbian, like that hat's down there, that's 1,500 years old and has been preserved because in Peru, it doesn't rain that much and is high elevation, is cold, and bacteria doesn't exist. So those things preserve. That thing is uh, 1,500 years old. And the motifs on that, actually very interesting, is a dragon. And we're going to come to dragon. Dragon is a big symbol, and I love dragons. So that thing had a dragon. I looked at it and said, is that a dragon? So I have to have it. <laughs> there is another textile down there which I will show. That is a cocoa leaf bag. Oh, here it is. So this uh, is over 1,000 years old again. They used to uh, store cocoa leaves in it. This is before uh, Mr. Escobar. This guy is, is a high elevation, so they have to chew uh, cocaine to keep uh, their broad circulation and don't pass out. So that's what they used to store coca leaves in this. Again, 1,000 years old. Oops. OK, I have a bunch of fabrics down there, too. I collect old texts. I like everything is old. I'm an old soul. I collect everything that's old. So there is a place in uh, Egypt, south of Cairo, they're called Fostad. There's a town called Fostad. And this used to be the dump for the Cairo. And Cairo is a very old city, and Egyptians go back five, six, seven thousand 7,000 years. So they used to take everything as a dump. Like, let's say, Marburg we have, the dump site we have, they used to be their dump. So they used to take everything there. So now, early 19th century, the Europeans figured out, oh, where are these, all these old textiles come from? And they said, the Fostad. But you don't want to go there. It's a dump. <laughs> so guess what? They went there. So they started excavating, excavating, but they did it in a, not a professional way. They just went there as a, as scavengers. So if you take layer after layer, you know how old things are and uh, documented. Unfortunately, they were not archaeologists, so they destroyed it, but they took fabrics out. I, anytime I see one I buy, I have a collection of maybe 20 of them. I looked at them. I asked people, it's very hard to tell how old they are unless you send it for carbon dating. And carbon dating is not, again, 100% on those. Uh, but there are some there, like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years old. I have some there. If, if you want later on, look at them. Please do. Uh, now get back to this rug. Mm -hmm. So I was telling you this old rugs and this old tradition of passing along designs and motifs. This is it. So it's a Pazuric rug. This Pazirik rug was excavated in 1948 in Altai Mountains. This is north of Afghanistan, uh, north of Turkmenistan. This is uh, area today, Siberia and Russia. And 1948 they excavated this. And it used to be the tomb of a Suthian prince. So it is 
carbon dated again is 2,500 years old. If you look at that, that is almost in perfect condition. This is actually the most preserved handwoven rug in the world, the oldest one that is most preserved, 2,500 years old. Is it, it is in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. It's downstairs at the end of an alley in a darker room than this. And that actually is one of the treasures of humanity. Not too many people know about it. It has a lot of symbolism on that, and I'm going to come back to that. This is 2,500 years old. I mean, if I say numbers, it's a little bit for us in the United States to comprehend numbers. 2,500 years is a lot. But that is, we weave that rug is still today. The same way, the same technique, the same design, same color, same wool. So that could have been woven 5,000 years before as well. So it is one of the mysterious things, and I'm going to come back to that. It is uh, images of Suthian riders. It is, uh, and the riders, if you look at them, how do they know it's Suthians? First of all, they found in Altai Mountains. But if you go to Persepolis, there is a set of stairs that leads to the great entrance of the palace. And there is, back then, the Persian Empire was the only empire in the world, the largest of its kind, 2,500 years ago we were talking about. And there is different ethnicities from different parts of that world. And Suthians were dressed like those riders and they have the horses. So they know they're Suthians. Uh, there's griffins in there, which we call Homa in our culture. Homa is this uh, mythical bird that's like a, a phoenix for us. And anytime this flies over our head, it brings us blessings, brings us uh, fortune. There is uh, griffins in there, and deer. Deer was their staple. So these people live in Altai Mountains, and there's a lot of deer. So they have deers there, and they all have numbers, and I'll show you. The squares in the middle, uh, they are the foundation of Babylonian palace, and also you find them in Persepolis. So these things, this is probably, I want to say, a good 2,000 miles away from Persepolis maybe 3,000 miles from uh, Babylon, but they have seen that. The people who wove this, they had seen the floors of those two palaces. <laughs> so it's just like it's not a new concept for us. We fly to Yucatan. <laughs> those guys have been to other places as well. That's a very important piece. All right. Uh, come back again to how old these <laughs> designs are. So there is an unbroken connection for thousands of years. I brought another sample. It's a two-headed animal. It represents a direct and unbroken line of woven motifs spanning more than at least 3,000 years. Opposing heads at either end representing struggling of opposite forces. Yin and yang, day and night, black and white, good and evil. They had these also those days. They have opposite forces, like you have two sides of a uh, magnet. You have two negatives, each other they're pushing each other away. So that's what it is, is down there I show you. Through, uh, though to have originated in the remote valleys of the Zagros Mountains of modern day Iran and spanning through the nations, even all the way to Lithuania. Zagros artists included two headed animals in mostly perishable materials such as wood and wool yarns, but it was eventually preserved unchanged from generation to generation through more durable materials such as local bronze, but is still woven and here today. So I brought a, I collect all things. So this is a double headed goat and this double headed goat, this is a hairpin and it is from Luristan, it's like about 3000 years old. And this design is the double-headed goat. It's, again, the yin and yang. You see it today in the rugs that they're woven. You see this is the double-headed goat right there. I don't know if it's too far. Then there is the double-headed goats upside down. These are the double-headed goats. And between this and this is 3,000 years. And there are illiterate people. They don't have it in writing or in painting or anything like that. So the great, 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 great grandma wove this. 
passed along to the great, 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 great daughter, and then passed to the other daughter. So you think about it. It's 3,000 years. They make the same design. How does pass along? Because they keep the symbol alive from one to the next, to the next, to the next. It's one of the oldest designs you can find. And again, these are the ones we have evidence of. There is things that you don't have evidence, and you don't know what they are, but they have existed. OK, importance of symbols. Symbols evoke profound emotions and memories. At a very primal level of our being, often without or making ration or conscious connections. They fuel our imagination. Symbols enable us to access aspects of our existence that cannot be accessed in any other way. Symbols are used in all facets of human endeavor. Symbols is widely used in traditional rug weaving. Weavers use rug symbols to communicate and convey ideas and information from one generation to the other generation. If you see those Hundred designs over there, they're all ram's horn. Think about it. Over thousands of years, this daughter decided, I don't want to copy my sister. Forget about it. I'm going to make a ram horn that's unique to me. And then she did that design and passed it along to her daughter, her granddaughter, and so on. I brought a piece. So if you look into this, Everywhere you see ram's horns. And this is the ram's horn right there, the green one. You see, uh, here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. And I will get to importance of the ram in a minute as well. Okay, now we get to this thing here. So, I will read it first and then. Div, the guardian of good and evil. Protector of the holiness is being attacked by the mythical dragon. The dragon, the most powerful creature of the ancient world, is bitten by the mighty lion, the king of animals. The lion, in return, is being taken out by the most unsuspecting rabbit in a reversal of, of perceived power role. The div acts as the predecessor to the ideological tree of life as his feet on dirt represent birth from the ground, raising up with all the experiences around the lovebirds symbolize marriage and love, and the branches and the leaves and flowers are our life experiences, and the fruits are our children. At the height of the tree and the contradictory to the definition of height, it is presenting the end of our lives, the top of the arch, if you look. But here, here is not an ending, but an opening to the more beautiful estate filled with different and colorful flowers representing beauty and wealth in the afterlife. Let me bring this up front. So talking about symbolism, this is the pinnacle of symbolism. It was actually one of the rarest pieces I've ever seen. It is woven probably over 200 to 250 years ago, south Iran, close to Indian border. The colors are highly unusual. Uh, it is probably southeast of Kerman. If you look in the bottom, div is like a European gargoyle. So it is actually protector, is not a devilish creature. So he's born from dirt, he's rising up. This is again tree of life. This is we come up. These are experiences. This is husband, wife, the children, all the experiences. You come up. And you don't die. You actually flourish. You blossom in a better world. And you go to paradise or what you perceive of being a better world. That is what that is. And this, again, this is 200, 300 years ago. Life is very easy for us. And we can imagine beauty. We look at pictures of Capri. We know what it is. Beautiful flowers. These people didn't have that luxury. They don't know what beauty is. They don't know what better life is. To them, this is paradise. This is where they're going to go. And it is the essence of human longing. We want always a better future. We want to have a more comfortable future. And especially for these people. This is all full of meanings. You see down there, the rabbit is biting, the lion lion is biting, the dragon, dragon is biting the thief. It's absolutely the paradox. 
This is the reverse of all roles. Life is full of surprises. So don't get surprised if the little enemy, the rabbit, comes and bites you. <laughs> so, you know, be kind. It is an amazing piece, full of expectations that get reversed. I had never seen anything like this, but it is a very good uh, representative of, again, life. Life it is fullest. You have everything in there you can imagine. And has that arch, by the way, as well, which I'm going to get back to prayer rugs. But this is not a prayer rug. This is just a uh, work of art hanging in the old uh, Eastern houses. They used to have niches. And then they used to hang important rugs or pictorial rugs in those niches, just showing as art. This is a beautiful thing. And I think, by the way, div is the origin of devil. So we said devil, and it is a bad thing, and it's ugly, and it's, you know, it takes and has horns. And I think it started with div. And the reason is because we think that, well, maybe like about 2,000, 3,000 years old in Europe, this guy had been there 14, 15,000 years. So I think it started from there. <laughs> so we get back to uh, symbols. Here we are. So. This rugged game, Pazurik, is one of the most important. This is actually, to me, more important than David in Florence. This is something that is one of a kind. They copied David. There is one in the plaza. You would not know if it's not the original David. Nobody has copied this yet. So if you look in the bottom, there is seven riders with seven horses. That's seven days of the week. If you look, there is four of them. There is four weeks. And added is 28 days. That's 28 days in the lunar calendar. Then you have fours and sixes. And four sides representing four weeks in a month and four seasons in one year. There is also important multiples of four and six. Four is a grounded and a stable number that evokes a feeling of calmness and solidity. Four is very much rooted in the physical world and is about being present and in the now. For example, there are four seasons, four elements, and four corners of the earth. Four is about building a strong foundation and developing a down-to-earth perspective. Six represents a balance between earthy and a spiritual realm. So this rug has a lot of sevens, which I don't want to talk about sevens because I heard Robert had a you guys had a big talk about number seven, so that probably you know better than me about number seven, but fours and sixes in that rug, which is very interesting. 2,500 years ago, they had this wisdom. They knew it. They had a full calendar where we think of us creating calendars, making days. No, they knew that before we did. It's a very important piece. Go to St. Petersburg, visit it. It's worth seeing it. Okay, now I'm going to get back to a little bit of designs. So Paisley, you guys know Sir Paisley because you have seen the shawls and you have seen, he copied the Bote. And very cleverly, he's more famous than Bote himself now. It's called Paisley. So represents in the shape of a teardrop. The Bote originates from ancient Persia in the Sasanid dynasty. And that is 224 to 651 AD the last Persian empire before the fall of Islam, before the rise of Islam, sorry. Particularly prevalent in wool or silk, textiles from Kerman, Iran, Kashmir, India. Believed to originate from Zoroastrian religion practices, representing a cypress tree and eternal flame. Actually, if you look at it, there is the cypress of Avarku. This is a 4,500 years old tree. If you look at it, the shape of it is very similar to a paisley bote. Presenting a cypher, two Zoroastrian symbols of life and eternity. In Zoroastrian poetry, the world for tree is the same world as immortality and deathlessness. As many cypress trees are mentioned in sacred concepts through poetry. Outdoor Zoroastrian temple often included cypress trees flanked by, on both sides by the eternal flames to signify a place of worship or sacredness. It is believed that cutting down a cypress tree is detrimental to your own good fortune and could result in disaster or disease. The cypress of Avarku, which you see there, is, four, is more than 5,000 years old and is the second uh, oldest living organization, organization in the world. 
and you can see the shape of it is like a Potev. The Potev actually became popular in Qajar and Pahlavi dynasties, but that's new. It's not old. You're talking about Zoroastrism. These guys are three, four thousand years old, and they had that design. That's one of the beautiful designs of rugs. Okay, ram's horn. This is the ram's horn you see in just about every rug. Uh, Crescent-shaped symbol used as a symbol to present fertility, heroism, power, and masculinity. Believed that women who weave ram horn motif would be searching such qualities in their future husbands. Okay. The significance of the ram horn symbol <laughs> stemmed from around 1260 BC and brought a whole, and then was coming to pieces that replaced it. For ancient civilization, taking care of the rams was seen as a great honor and important task as the ram was never ending source of valuable natural raw material. So again, we're going back to the tribal people. What is important to them is the ram. It gives them meat, it gives them milk, it gives them butter, cheese, and their livelihood. So they used to take this ram horn, I mean the ram, and then take it down to the villages if they were uh, agricultural societies down there. They used to trade for wheat, for uh, all sorts of materials they need. But the ram was very important to them because it was son of wealth. The more you rams or sheep you had, the wealthier you were, and you could dominate the neighbors or uh, region. That's again, ram's horn is everywhere you see. Pomegranate is native to Eastern and Mediterranean region and appears to have been brought to Asia from Iran. Oh, I love pomegranate. All Iranians love pomegranate. Gosh, it's delicious. <laughs> Using rugs to express fertility and abundance because have you seen it? It's full of little seeds and when it explodes, it just many of them go around. Most prevalent in Eastern Turkestan, where motif is used and all over design. When Khotan is a north east Iran, and it was an oasis, Samarkand, Khotan, and there you have a lot of pomegranates, and the designs are from that region, quite a lot of pomegranates. Its connection abundance drives from the resemblance of a pomegranate containing several sweet and beautiful seeds within the fruit itself. Many times a pomegranate design is shown in half or exposed the seeds. Uh, you can see them, there are pomegranate trees, and there's many of them. Those usually seen Khotan rugs. Okay, come to my favorite thing, dragons. So I follow dragons. They are in every culture. It's amazing. You go to Peru, El Dragon. You go to Mexico, Yucatan. You go to the Kukulkan. You go to Iran, Ejdeha. You go to China, the dragon. is everywhere. I don't know what it was. I think probably was the alien ships. <laughs> that they see them flying and they used to shoot fire or missiles at somebody. It, it is amazing. They are everywhere dragons. So the dragon is considered the most powerful astrological symbol in the Eastern Zodiac, whose purpose is to guard the tree of life, protecting pearls of wisdom and harnessing power of both earthly and celestial elements. Dragons are featured throughout the carpets produced in Tibet, Mongolia, Far East, and especially in the Caucasus Mountains. When featured in rugs, dragons depict an unreal creature of the imagination, incorporating traits and features from animals that inhibit land, air, and sea. Unlock his winged, fire-breathing European cousin, which is mostly portrayed as an evil being. The Chinese dragon is a creature of good omen that brings good fortune and prosperity. Several leaders include a dragon in their arts work made for them to represent authority. They were also thought to be deeply symbolic creatures that bring wealth, health, happiness, and knowledge to common people. Dragons are everywhere. It's amazing. You see that as a Chinese throne. When it's a gold background in a Chinese textile or rug that's made for the court. So the emperor was allowed to wear gold. People around him, just immediately around him, they were allowed to wear gold. Anybody else wears gold, they will get beheaded. That's an amazing thing. That was what happened. <laughs> that Chinese gold. <laughs> you see the white dragon over there? That is a Caucasian dragon. It is one of the most beautiful and enigmatic things in Caucasus. This is another one, is a little more abstract. And the one up there, that's a 17th century dragon and a phoenix and a pinball. But I'm going to get to this dragon in a bit later. You guys not falling asleep yet? 
No. All right, I like this audience, I like this audience. I was going to get some tequila shots if you're falling asleep. But... All right, all right, all right. Here we go, we go to Phoenix, Seymour. Seymour, I have good memories of Seymour because this is our old Persians. We believe in Seymour when Homa is flying over our head and definitely bring up. And the Shah's time, our Iranian national uh, airline just called Homa, and that is Seymour. And it was incidentally the blinging of alphabets of the Hawaii. Uh, it is the Iranian airline used to be HMO. So that was Homa. It was by luck or by design or God made it like that. I don't know. So that was Homa. So Phoenix depicted in Persian art as a winged creature in the shape of a bird big enough to carry a whale. I don't know. They have never seen whale, but okay. Appears as a peacock with the head of a dog, claws of a lion, and sometimes the face of a human. Seymour was inherently well-meaning and obviously female, as she considered to purify the land and waters, hence bestow fertility. In art, the Seymour is portrayed as having hostility toward the snake, and I'm talking about the big snake, the dragon, as the two are often seen fighting each other. Okay, now we get to this favorite <coughs> subject of mine, Phoenix and Dragon, is right there. Uh, I, do I need to talk to this or okay. they can't hear? Good, okay. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me go this way. This is the phoenix, that is the dragon. Phoenix, dragon. So these are tribal people. They are looking forward for a fight between phoenix and a dragon. Why? So they never came out during the daylight because this is, again, in their imagination. So they came always in a cloudy skies. And when they start fighting each other, they don't like each other at all. Phoenix and dragon. They're both good, but they don't like each other. So they start fighting each other. And from their fight, from their sweat, from their tear, from their blood, rain creates. And rain brings prosperity. These are, again, people that are dependent on Mother Nature to get rain. And they're always hoping, praying for rain. And this is it. When Phoenix and Dragon get to a fight, they create rain. But what happens when the sky is cloudy? So maybe they are sleeping. We should wake them up. So the old cultures they used to go get the big drums five six seven villages and they used to drum to wake the dragon up to wake the seymour or the phoenix up what happened is i studied a little bit physics so the vibration of these drums going up in the sky puts the water molecules next to each other binds them together and that rain creates is like seeding the clouds but by doing that, I mean, imagine you have like 50 huge drums, boom, 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 creates that vibration. So the little molecules in the sky get together, rain creates. So that's what they thought. Oh, we woke up the dragon and the phoenix. But in reality, it was their doing. That's one of the oldest motifs, and they're hoping for the rain. This is, I found this one in Kuwait. I'm rugaholic. I mean, it's... I'm scavenging the whole world for rugs. I found this thing in Kuwait. It's a quite old piece. It's in mint condition because the Easterners, they take off their shoes when they go home. So it is not taking the shoes off. It's not cleaning it that ruins the rugs. So what it is, if you take your shoes off, the dirt and sand that got stuck in there doesn't grind the wool. So that's why always in good shape. You go to Japan, they have 16th century rugs that they're in mint condition. You go to New York City, Dust of them is left. <laughs> but anyway, this is a beautiful piece. So, that's Dragon. And this one, uh, the one I had the picture of actually is in the Berlin Museum. I actually have seen it. It's an amazing piece. Okay, now we get unexpected messages woven in the rug. I have to ask Kehan to help me. No, this one, this one, this one. Get this one, Kayon, here, right there. Can you get this side? I want to start from the bottom. Okay. This rug was woven in the village of Bijar. It is in West Iran. These guys have the finest wool in the world. It's high elevation. The elevation makes the wool fine because it's cold, it's windy, it's rainy, it's snowy. The sheep has to develop 
a very fine hair for the water not to penetrate inside and touch the skin and freeze them. And at the same time, becomes very high lanolin content because the oil wards off the water. The water runs off of them. It's like a nice uh, shawl that you, know, you put around yourself when it's raining, so water goes off of it. So these people have the best in the world. It's a story of a girl. So again, women read this. Here she is, content, happy. Can you see her? There's a little girl down there with a little skirt, and they love color. And their skirts are just ridiculously colorful. This one, she didn't put color. I don't know why, but that's what it is. Go a little more. So talking about symbols and messages. So that's her. That's her dog. Another dog. The little chicken she has. Little chicks. There is a neighbor with an orange tent. That is handsome. So this is woven. Now the mother is saying, the sister is saying, oh, she's interested in the guy in the orange tent. Mm -hmm. She didn't tell him anything, but she wove it here. I bet you she didn't tell him. And then she puts this cute peacock, as you can see. Again, sign of joy, sign of happiness, sign of hopefully we're going to get into a colorful future. We go up. We have sunny days. Is the sun. This color actually, out of the contest, this is the most awesome color. They get it, it's called aubergine. It is uh, eggplant shells that they cook and it is a fantastic color. Anytime you see purple that's not faded in any rug, that indicates that's older than uh, 1900 because it was a hard color to do and post 1900, Siba Gaigi developed this purple color that's with fuchsine and fades. So anyway, this is not faded and that's an old color. You go up, there she is. That's probably her, that's the sister. They're dancing, they're having fun. The orange tent, the reminder is still here. <laughs> Watch it. You go farther up. Again, you have this beautiful eight-sided star. Eight-sided star is one of the oldest uh, motifs in human history. You go up. Now the guy's dancing. You have a son of comb here. Comb is son of purity, virginity. So the guy's dancing. She had a dance with the guy, but she's still there. She's still virgin. You go, what happens here? Now the whole family is dancing, and she's a smoking hookah. Why would she smoke hookah? There's a big party. She can't get drunk. Here she is. She's living off the rug, but look at her. She has a smile on her face and that colorful skirt. So this girl, happy. 1870s probably this rug was woven. It is 150 years ago. Back then, they lived to be maybe 40, 50 years on a top end. She's dead for a good 110, 120 years. Her messages are still here. This beautiful audience saw her getting married and sending symbols. She told the family, I want to get married to that guy. And she did. So that's one of the most beautiful things I discovered that years ago. I love that thing. Some people want to buy it. I go, oh, don't buy it. Don't buy it. <laughs> So anyway, that's one of them. Let's get back to some symbols, and then we're going to come to some fun part. Since the second time, oh, lion, lion, lion. Since the second millennium BC, the lion has been a symbol of ro ro royalty and power. The lion rugs were often made for khans, for the heads of the tribe. The spreading of lion rug in royal courts is an old tradition. Since many of the viewers, most of them women, had never seen actually a lion, either in real life or in an image, they relied on the imagination, which is why all of the lions vary. Some of them are goofy looking. They look like a little cat, little mice, but they're lions. They had never seen a lion. They're tribal people living far off. They didn't have TV. They didn't have you know, iPhones. They didn't have images. They didn't have books. So that's what they thought lions are. These two are actually really good lions. <laughs> we got Lotus, son of rebirth, purity, beauty, and perfection used in many Eastern religions. The Mughal emperors referred to themselves as lotus. They were gift of God to the earthy people, and they used to get born every day and be spreading joy to the rest of the people. So they thought they're gifts to us. And they make amazing rugs they left over. If you go to Lisbon, there is Gulbenkian Museum has the most amazing rug that they are from Mughal era. 
and Mughals, the nicest rugs were made like around 1600s to 1700s, and they're in perfect condition. We got the cross said to offer protection against evil, catastrophes, or ill will. Cross is actually also a sign of the Armenian religion. So back then in those areas, in the Caucasus Mountains, the Ar Armenians are actually one of the very first uh, Christians. And I think probably the first Christians. And they are very proud of their crosses and they put it everywhere. Like uh, that rug is called San Andrew's Cross rug and those are Armenian crosses and you see them everywhere. They are very prevalent. I have, uh, if you see this piece out here, you see the crosses in it. This is Coptic. It is a 6th century, 1500 years old. And the copy of it is in the Victorian Ovid Museum on the wall. It is a, I look at that thing, I just get a joy every day out of it. Like I have it hanging. It's a pile rug. And they weave it still today the same way. And they have the same motifs. And if you look at the colors on that, it just stunningly survived 1,500 years, 1,600 years. It's amazing. And that's a cross. And they made that just to show they are Christians. And that was made to be hung on the wall. And it's just beautiful. It's symbolism right there. It doesn't get any more symbolism than that. Mm -hmm. We got a stars, find in tribal, village, or city rugs. The eight-pointed star is one of the oldest motifs in human history and represents happiness. Besides the cave paintings, I don't think there is anything older than the eight-sided star. And if you go out, you look at any culture, and I'm talking about any culture, you have this eight-sided star. It is a... Uh, People looked in the skies and probably they had crooked eyes like I do and they see eight-sided stars instead of, you know, round. So, but eight-sided star is everywhere and just about, again, every rock has a star in it because people used to look up. Um, I'm going to bore you. So all this I'm saying is about to change. All the history we know is just maybe good for another five, ten years. All these hypotheses we have about human development is changed. A few years ago... Uh, German archaeologists discovered this temple in Turkey, which is 12 to 14,000 years old, Gölbeke Tepe. So what I have learned, what I have read all my life is we were gatherers, we were hunters, we were uh, people that we were always working, always going out. We didn't have time until we became civilized, let's say. We were living in the cities or we were in the villages and we become farmers. Now we have the fire and farming. We have extra time. Now what, you have, what happens when you have extra time? You think of things you would not think usually when you're always busy working, 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 working. So we looked up. So, whoa, there is another world out there. Religions got created. So our understanding is religions come after we became civilized, like civilization. But that temple is 12,000 years old. That is 7,000 years before we think humans start having religions. So that is going to change the whole idea. I'm still preaching my old choir, but it is completely off limits. If you, you guys should Google it, Gulbeke Tepe. And I was going to go there, but unfortunately it's very close to Syria and there's a war going on there, so I'm waiting for it to quiet down a little bit. But you should see it. It's 12 to 14,000 years old temple. And there's not just one. They discovered multiple within the next 5, 10, 15 miles. So we have been there for a long time. Again, we are not these creatures that have been limited by time. Dogs. Symbolize protection, loyalty, honor, and defense. I mean, think about dog. You think about dog, it's just like the closest thing we have come to any animal. And they rely on us. They love us. Look at the look they have. So you see it in a lot of rugs. Every girl had a dog, even back then. And they put it everywhere. I mean, if you have a rug, old rug at home, take a picture, I send, send it to me, I find you a dog. It's a little creature of a dog in any old rug. It is the most beautiful thing. I love dogs. I love dogs. Okay, peacock signifies immortality or divine protection. In rugs, a peacock is depicted as a symbol of pride and beauty. And they are so many different. That one over there looks like a mechanical peacock. The one in the Mohtasham, it looks like a real peacock. I cannot paint that thing. I don't know how they weave this. It's just little knots. And this is the peacock from that girl that got married. It's beautiful. I mean, look at that peacock. It says, wow, it looks like NBC took that. <laughs> you know? 
Okay, fish. Fish in Persian means mahi. Like mahi mahi. Those guys probably, they were Persians, the Hawaiians. Anyway, <laughs> used to symbolize prosperity and are a very popular Nowruz symbol or gift. Nowruz is our new year. We celebrate, we Persians celebrate the rebirth of the nature. So the first day of spring, the first hour of spring is our new year, has been there for like 5,000, 6,000 years, and we ce celebrate that. That's what called Nowruz. And fishes are a big part of it. Fishes usually are formed in a set of four while used to represent holy person with magical and healing power. Well, forget about this. My idea is these people are way ahead of us. This is a fish, as you can see. This is a fish. And this is, I think, our earth, our environment. As long as we keep the two fishes encircling and in shape, our earth stays in balance. Herati is a newer design. This is probably post finding out Earth is round. So this is the design. And it, you find this also in quite a lot of old rugs. Well, 17th, 18th century pieces. Eagle. Birds generally represent good luck, power, and happiness, although some, like owls and ravens, depict bad luck and death. A resting eagle represents high-mindedness of the spirit. The imperial eagle from the Caucasus region inspires an eagle medallion that can be frequently found with slight variations in Kazakhs. The Kazakhs always make this. These are, again, Armenian people from Karabakh, and that's where they have fights, Azerbaijanis and Armenians over Nagorno-Karabakh. This is Karabakh, and they are very similar people. I mean, they have been living there for thousands of years. They are, you could not distinguish one from the other. They look the same, they have the same genes, the same food, very similar language, but they hate each other. <laughs> this comes from that area. Is Nagorni Karabakh, he's an eagle Kazakh, is a beautiful piece. I've been fortunate enough to have a few of those. Tulip, the most commonly used to express the birth of a male child, as they are one of the first flowers to bloom in the spring. As early spring flowers, tulips symbolize growth and new beginning. Tulips are also a symbol of Ottoman Turkey. Tulips were in the court of Ottomans quite a lot. Okay, now we get to the two last pieces I brought with myself. And these guys have both histories. So I'm going to go to the first one. Okay, so this rug was woven in Shirvan area. This is in Azerbaijan. Today's Azerbaijan. When this rug was woven, that was Iran. So the Russians annexed it. So they are very good in annexing parts of Iran. <laughs> so <laughs> they, uh, they're Turkic speaking people and they have been there for a good, uh, I think 1200 years, even longer. But it is a story again. The girl is full of imagination. You see, you see the colors, first of all, they cannot go to Walmart or Michael's and buy the wool, the yarn, the color they want. So what they do, they go get a sheep, shear it. That's a lot of work for one tribal lady. And back then, they were all smaller. All humans, last four generations, they were substantially smaller. Now look, you're this big, holding a sheep, shearing it. They shear it, they wash the wool, they card it, they spin it is a lot of work. Then they go to the mountains, dig the roots. So they get matter, they get uh, indigo, they get weld, they get saffron, they get eggplants, they get all sorts of different materials, and then they cook. And cooking is not easy. Again, these are steps. There's no trees that much around. So you need to go find wood, make a fire, put a pot, boil it, cook it, dry it, and now you have the raw materials. And that took a year to get the raw materials. And then now you start weaving it. But then that's, again, challenges. Because you cannot have too wide of a loom because you have to move every six months. And then every six months you have to pack and go. So make this rug, short set. It takes maybe two, three years. And every little dot is a little double knot. Try to mend your sock one day. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Do this thing here. Forget about it. So the girl starts. We have, again, the eight-sided star. We have the ram's horn. We have these beautiful peacock tails. We have the crosses. Again, the eight-sided star. 
You coming up? This is the little dog she has. Isn't that cute? Life is a rainbow. Quite nice. Guess whom she meet? Her number one choice. And these people are writing not in Arabic. They're writing in Latin. So number one choice is the guy with the mustache. You see him with the big hat? Comes up. Again, she weaves this thing. And that is a subliminal message to the parents again. And this is how the girls send the messages, the motifs, the symbols. There she is. She's dancing. You see the skirt she has on? And she's cute. Looks like she has some little makeup on. She's dancing. Comes up. Again, fills this. You have the running water. Is again, son of prosperity. You have this interlocking mini dragons. It brings wealth and happiness. You have the eight-sided star everywhere. No two are the same. If you start from the bottom going up, no two are the same. You have the running dog in the board. This is the head of the dog, and this is the legs. It's a running dog, we call it. And the running dog is, again, son of loyalty, uh, honor. We have the interlocking dragons again, the little dragons, if you can see, in multiple colors. She's full of fantasy, full of ideas. You come up, you have this little bug here. I don't know what kind of bug it is, but it's a bug. You come up, come up. She's still a virgin. A comb is a sign of purity. It's still a virgin. So don't panic. If you don't want me to marry him, I don't marry him, but there she is. Next step, we go up. This is the cutest little thing here. I don't know what that is. It's a half human, half dog, half cat, whatever. It just has legs. Comes up. I can tell she finished this side first. Although this is higher, and they make it on a loom, and every 30 centimeter, which is a foot, she has a return. So she did this side first. Her lock with the key still closed. She's still a virgin. Out here, she married the guy. So that's the fateful evening. Her name, her initial starts with an M. God knows what her name is, but she knew M. So she put it in there. That's actually a big deal for uh, people that they are illiterate. So she put the one down there and M down there. We're talking about 150 years ago. She's gone. But this piece is still here and tells a lot of stories, brings her memories. So this thing is very dear to me. I just look at it and say, this is one of the most fascinating sheer ones. It has a story. All of them have a story. They just don't tell. There were two groups of women that weave this, the older women and the younger women. The younger women were not allowed to weave until they reached the age of puberty. And they used to watch the mother, the grandmother weaving, and they're anxious to weave because they're sitting there for hours doing nothing. So they have actually recorded all these designs, all the movement, they know how to do it, but they have to wait until they become age of puberty. And then they start making rugs. The young girls make amazing rugs, colorful, full of mistakes, but a lot of fantasy goes in it. These people, Look at, they make sometimes, they make a mahi is like this long, the next one is this big, the borders go zigzag, gets in the, because they're learning it. The older lady, the other hand, wants to show superiority. She makes everything perfect. The corners are perfect, the edges are perfect, the designs are all the same, identical going on. You look at a rug, you can tell it's woven by a younger woman and an older woman. I like the imperfections better. So this is done by a younger girl, and you can see not much of a symmetry. There is symmetry, but not that much. Okay, come to the last rug of the evening, then I stop boring you. Here it is. Now, this rug is woven, I would say, between 1600s to 1700s. It was a very special piece. It's an Ottoman piece. It was woven with the highest probability for the Sultan. It is, we call it a prayer rug. Prayer rug means has a niche. Old times it's called Sultan's head. The Sultan prays to the direction of Mecca. This one, the Sultan, is a very special person. All prayer rugs start woven from the bottom. So you weave it, you make a knot, you pull it down, you cut it with the scissor or knife, creates a nap that goes down. But what happens with nap going down? When Sultan is praying, his hand glides slightly harder. So the sultan makes these weavers weave the rug upside down. 
So you're making a painting, instead of painting the face like this, you have to paint it upside down. So this is woven upside down, so the nap goes this way. So the sultan has an easy time praying. <laughs> Poor guy. It is made of camel hair. Camel hair is a very pure hair. It's hard to weave. It's made of camel hair. Again, now we have different cultures in here, symbols. This actually is a dragon. It's two dragons. This is a dragon right there. We have the light hanging. It's a sign of enlightenment, sign of pureness and wisdom. We have the cloud band. Cloud band is quite essential Chinese. What is it doing here in Turkish rug? So they had silk route going back and forth, the ideas, the designs go back and forth. So this is a cloud band. We have the clouds itself. Again, a Tibetan uh, Nepalese motif. We have the interlocking dragons. God forbid something bad happens to the Sultan. Most important. Actually, let me say the one that's least important. is praise for Sultan. All written in Arabic. Arabic alphabet. Not Arabic itself. It was written in Persian with an Arabic alphabet. Back then, on the court language in Turkey, in Ottoman times, and in Mughal times in India, they both spoke Persian in the court. Outside, they spoke Hindi, they spoke Turkish, but in the court, they all spoke Persian. That was a class. So this is written in Persian, all of it. I cannot read it. I know Persian to read, but this one I cannot read. I tried so many times. It's all language and just really hard. So it's, it's praise to the Sultan. I can read a little bit of it, but it's praise to the Sultan. They have one of my friends out here. He's very good in Persian. I will have him read it after. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the most important thing, we get this old design. I don't know if you can see it or not. This little motif down here is Goddess of Anatolia. Goddess of Anatolia is 6,000 BC. They found that little statue in Anatolia, 6,000 BC. This is the mother of all of us, Goddess of Anatolia. And this is, again, 200 years old, 300 years old. So this is like 7,000 years later, they still put that motif in there. Goddess of Anatolia, give us birth. It went to Greece and then came back to Turkey again. So Goddess of Anatolia has been everywhere, and it is our mother, basically. And this is what tribal societies appreciate it, old people appreciate it, and I do. Women, that's what we are here for, and that's why we are survived so many millennia. Without them, we would not be here, and this is Goddess of Anatolia. Anyway, and it has tulips in there, and you can see it's a fantastic piece, full of meanings. And this little drug has thousands of years of human history just in there. Oh, I forgot. Prayer rugs. Prayer rugs we associate with Islamic religion. You look at this as, oh, Muslims pray. It's not. And a year, 1492, Ferdinand comes, takes over Spain, get the last uh, Islamic caliphate out, he surrender. The first act he does kicks, unfortunately, the Jews out of Spain. So what do they do? The Turkish Sultan says these are the people of faith. He sends ships to Spain to pick all the Jews, bring them to Turkey. So they 30,000 to 200,000, that's estimates, the Jews went from Spain to Izmir and Constantinople back, back then. What did they bring with themselves? If you look at old 1500s, 1400s, there's no prayer rugs, no pictures, nothing. We don't have any. The Jews bring with themselves the Torah, the Torah, the parochah. So they go get synagogues, they make synagogues, and they need to store the Torah behind the curtain. The Torah curtain is called parochah. If you look here, like the old wooden scrolls we open of the Torah, these are those. So Muslims got commissioned to make parochah covers for the Jewish synagogues. They made it and they look, whoa, that is good looking. So why don't we make more of this for ourselves? That's how they started making prayer rugs. So you see, it goes back and forth between so many different cultures and it's amazing. I mean, this little rug, it goes from 6,000 BC to 1700s to 1492 to today with you. So that is the last rug I had to show. 
I thank you so all very much for enduring me talking. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. I hope you learned something, enjoyed it. And I want to thank Robert and Ross. Where is Ross over there? I thank you guys very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Big your pardon? You're taking questions, right? I don't know the answers, but I can't take yes, questions. No, I'm just kidding. Yes, yes, please, please. Yeah, first of all, Michael, thank you for uh, sharing your session with us. Oh, thank you very much for coming. I I'm wondering if you could just share briefly a little bit about how you identify, you know, that around the turn of the century, the German, you know, infections of synthetic dye and how you identify, you know, back to the... Two things that makes it a lot easier. You remember I showed you that purple? The two dyes that stick out, they're orange, like your jacket, and the purple. The purple fades to a cream color. So if you look at the back of the rug, it's purple. You turn it on the pile side, they fade very quickly in the sun, they become a cream color. You open the weave slightly, you will see it. I didn't bring any newer rugs to show you. Rugs that they are post 1900s, a lot of them have that orange color, Bright, stays bright orange. So the irony is, again, the paradox of the rug weaving is back then, they could make the dyes. They get the orange and they can get the uh, eggplant with a little bit of effort. But they had to go outside and buy those two dyes with the cash, cold, hard cash. And that was a hard thing to do. They thought it's so special, that's why they put them in there. Nowadays, we look at it and say, oh, they're bad. Let's not touch these things. But actually, they were the pinnacle of dying back then. So how ideas change? Okay. Yes, ma'am. I don't understand the aubergine. If it's new, if it's a newer rug, it fades cream? Yes, yes, oh, okay. yes. Okay. For a period post 1900s, between 1900 to like 1930s, 1940s, they used this uh, synthetic dye. Right. Siba Gaigi created the synthetic dye you could uh -huh. buy out. And they liked it. They were so excited about it, these tribal people, that, wow, look at this dye. It's so bright. Right. Okay. But it oh, yes. Okay, I understand. And also, I wanted to know, please, um, this, where's your little uh, double-headed hairpin? Oh, what's the relationship? Is there any relationship between this symbol and the uh, double-sided Janus, which the... The two-headed the two Janus? The two-headed Janus, like, uh -huh. actually, if you look oh, at this oh, one I here. Oh, I guess I missed this. This I is a, they all have the double-headed. Yes. They have, we have also an evil person in our culture that has double-headed snakes on his head. And, uh -huh. yes, a lot of it has to do with opposites. Right, Attracting right. each okay. other or pushing each other away. Uh -huh. okay. So, yes, opposites attract. Uh -huh. And, actually, same pushes each other away. Like, you have two negatives of a... Magnet, it pushes each other away, whereas you know, two opposite the plus and minus attracts each other. Yes, so. thank you very uh, much. Since we're streaming, we're trying to get this is for the stream, the mic. So, when you ask a question, let me give you the mic. Yes, ma'am. Um, now, in all thank you for coming and thank you for wearing that shirt. That's a beautiful paisley. <laughs> I love yes. things like this. Bote, I correct it. No paisley, bote, bote, bote. It's paisley, isn't it? I don't know. Bote. Oh. Paisley copied both ah. <laughs> Gotta know your history. <laughs> um, now, are there any teachers or heroes in any of this? I mean, you certainly have focused and brought out the, um, the strengths of the, you might say, of the common people in their interactions. But I'm just wondering, because I've seen this yes. big symbol of the devil. That's the devil, right? Uh, yes. Uh, heroes, we don't have woven. We have like Shapur's statue, but that's not a hero woven. Yeah. Hero for us is Munde nature. The mother nature is the hero for all these people. Okay. And the tribal people is the rain that comes. That's what they're longing for. Oh, they don't have celebrities. They don't have they don't Kim have Kardashian or something like that. Just no, curious. They don't. <laughs> they don't. They don't. <laughs> The world was better, a better place. <laughs> yes. Who, who's asking? This lady. Oh. I'm curious to know how the whole design process happened back then. Did they actually draw the patterns down and then figure it out 
you know, how many knots go into creating yes, and that's then a good question. replicating. That is the workshop pieces. Workshop Maybe. pieces, when they brought men to work, they had it all pre-made, so they go after numbers and cartoons. But as I mentioned, the little girl was watching the right. grandmother, was watching the mother, memorized all those designs in her head. When she got permission to weave, she started weaving those designs. So it is all from the memory. And it's so passed from mother. as they went on? They didn't generally improvise. The ones that they were a little bit advanced, they wanted different, they changed the design slightly. Do you remember the hundred uh, designs I had from the ram horn? Right. They're all the same base idea, but a little bit different variation. So most of the designs, you see like that double-headed goat, oops, is going for 3,000 years without any changing. Not recorded. Oh, Just recorded. all in the head. But when That's why it's dead. This art is dead. So all these tribal people, they moved on. They are very, very few people that they're still living a tribal life. It's a harsh life. It's not easy. And they move to the cities. They become uh, more... Uh, they go sell cigarettes on the street instead of weaving this, to be honest with you. It has changed. They go answer at and telephone, you know, for instance. Uh, it's uh, not an easy life, and these people have moved on. And once you have a little generational gap between the weavers, so if you don't have the mother there, the daughter is not going to see it. The daughter goes to school, is not spending time next to the mother, is over. It's a, it's a dead art, unfortunately. Yes? Were there cultures that, where men were weavers predominantly? Predominantly, not that I know. Men are lazy. <laughs> Men are lazy. No, this is a hard work, is a, is a work of love, is not necessarily rewarding or is not uh, making money. No, they, are, they do this thing because they want to pass the symbol to the next generation. They want to put embed something important for the next generation, and that's what women do. Yes. And you forgot to mention while you were going through all the steps of preparing the wool and yes. the, the dye and all that, that there's probably small children running around and maybe one on the back and meals to yes. prepare and all that. Other yes, way. all of it. Yeah. No, they, they have to tend to the sheep, they have to cook, they have uh -huh. to go get the wood, they have to clean the tents, they need to barter with the neighbor to get another dye. No, this is, yes. this is we are living in the... <laughs> Best time a human has ever lived. Yeah. It might sound funny to a lot of people. So, oh, they are in a rough patch and this and this is the best time any human has ever lived. Yes. Go back five generations, six generations, go thousand years ago where these women lived. Yes. It's a harsh life. Yes. It's Hike. not easy. It's... Hike for the water, carry the water. Uh, if you have water, yeah. you don't know where the water is going to come. It's not Kachuma getting full or not. It's just, where do you want to get the water? Yeah. And you know, you have kids. And think about it. People used to have a lot more kids because half of them would die before age of five. Uh -huh. And then you need to have the kids, not because necessarily you want to have the kids, but because you are at 45, you're enabled to work. So they come back, they tend your sheep, they go farm your land, one maybe the elder one, and then help you get fed the last four years of your life. Whereas now all of us, who is going to come, which kid is going to come to feed us? You know, <laughs> <laughs> which land they're going to, you know, cultivate. So it is, a, it is a different life, very harsh. I totally appreciate these women who did this. It's completely uh, extraordinary. Comes through in your attitude, your appreciation of women, and oh, I my mom, my mom is my superhero. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yeah, no, it is it is a harsh life, and they did pretty amazing job yes. by doing this. Internet question. So there's a a question from the internet, and the question is from Susan, who says, "Could you tell us anything about Berber rugs?" I'm not a very good specialist. I don't know very much Berber rugs, but they are woven in North Africa. I used to have Berber rugs. Unfortunately, I don't have too many of them because, it's a, again, we're talking about wool being on a high elevation of a good quality. When you go to lower elevation in a hot climate, the wool loses its quality. So what it is in a desert, for instance, the sheep tend to have much coarser hair, much less lanolin, 
And that for some reason attracts moth because it's easier to get to the wool and eat the protein without the oil around it. And you get more out of it. So I used to have a couple of Berber rugs. They brought a bunch of moth and I decided not to carry them anymore. But they are, they are works of art as well and they have been around. They're not very old. The Berbers, the oldest one I have seen is maybe mid 19th century. And a comment. This was fantastically interesting. Thank, Whoa. thank you. What and was it again? Can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And please put all this into a book. Mm. Talking about books, thank you so much. I'm not that talented or gifted, but if anybody wants to buy a book, I highly recommend this book. I, have, I used to get this thing and give it to clients nowadays. You know, the print, people don't print anymore, unfortunately, and it's getting harder to get. It is by Murray Elan Jr. He used to be a scholar and a rug dealer in Berkeley. Nicest guy, and he wrote this book. It's very comprehensive. I recommend you get a book like this. Don't read all of it. Read the intro. Look into pages. Pick the design that catches your eye. Go through it two, three times. Don't read. Don't read. Go catch the design you like. Read that section only. Read that section only because this is like any art. It has a vibrancy. It has a resonance. So you will like a type of rug. You're not going to like all the rugs. You're going to like a type of rug. And that, pursue that. Research that one rug. See what is what catches your eye. Why do you like this? And then, then if you want to read the book, read the book. But I have read like so many books. It's just like, there's a lot of books written about rugs. This, yeah. this actually is a good book. I brought it. It's called... Oriental Carpets, a, Compreh a Complete Guy by Murray Elan Jr. He's actually a really good book. And it, it wasn't that expensive. I used to give as a gift, but nowadays maybe more expensive. Thank you. Another question from the internet from Marlon. Any information on Gola Eton? What is it called? G-O-L. Gole? Gole Beton. G-O-L-A-B-E-T-O-O-N. Sorry, don't the remember. Gold means flower. What? Gulabetun. Don't know, unfortunately. No, sorry. Singing directions, something? S the singing directions? No. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, just the same. Uh, Michael. Yes, sir. Like if I was asked to uh, identify the symbols, all the symbols that, you know, some I could identify, others I wouldn't be able to, you know, because they're. They're not obvious, at least. They're, what, they're not what? obvious symbols like a stop sign, no. Uh, but if you're in it, you look at them for so many years. I'm doing yeah. it since I'm a little kid. I look at it and I say, oh, that's what it is. But certain ones you can recognize, you know, like it is a common in any culture, like endless uh, cloud bands. That is a sign of eternity. You see that, you know, like flowers is a sign of beauty, you know, like birds, you know, these things are... Uh, more obvious. Yeah, you're right. They're not. But that I obvious. just wondered it's, if that book would help. It, you know. The book will help a lot. Yeah. The book will help a lot. Has <clears throat> all sorts of designs in it, and is actually a very good book. I highly recommend. Shows a uh, good selection of rugs, different rugs from different periods. Uh, lately, I used to collect these fine rugs, but then, as older I'm getting, the longer I'm in this business, the longer I see rugs, the more I know I don't know much. So I start getting into older pieces. Now I'm collecting things that they are three, four hundred years old. They are very uncommon. You're not going to find them on the internet or anywhere. It's just very uncommon. And it just, between us, we are a few rugaholics. The doctor is out here, a good sample. We, <laughs> we are a rare bunch that we find these things and we trade between each other. But I would recommend get it, if you can, older pieces. New pieces are commercial. It's good for decorating a room. But if you want something that has a soul, it needs to be 19th century, 18th century. It just gives you such a joy. You hang one of these on the wall, it's better than any art form. I go to, the other day I went to a museum and they have this white painting, huge, and a white painting cut in half with a little bit whiter side. And <laughs> people are standing in front of it in ooh and all. And I looked at this, I go like, what is this? Oh, they paid $60 million for this. So, could be $600 million, could be $6. I would you know, not know what to begin with. But for instance, you go look at Ruben, you go look at Michelangelo, you know, those things, 
they take hours, they take lifetime to make, that is hard to do. Picasso, God bless him, greatest business artist. You know, four lines, I could get one that's 90%. Within a day, I can paint one that's close to 90% of it. But try to do that. Impossible. I did repairs. I did all sorts of things. I still do. I cannot weave two square inch of that. It's amazing to me. Things that take hours, takes experience, takes lifetime of uh, working on it, those are valuable to me. So are these certain rugs. Not all of them again, but all the ones have that soul. You're buying or you're getting, you're inheriting somebody's soul inside the rug. Somebody's is woven from the heart, spun from the soul, we call it. So those things have a soul to them. You look at that, you feel like, wow, this sultan must have had it pretty good. <laughs> you know, beautiful rug collections. All museums have amazing rugs. Which ones? Met, Met has amazing rug collection. v &A in London has an amazing collection. Uh, if the best rug collection, I mean, I go, anytime I go to Venice, I go upstairs on the St. Mark's uh, church. Amazing things. You like, like wow, Gulbenkian in Lisbon. Uh, I've been fortunate enough that I can travel, so I go to all museums. Museums have really nice stuff. I have amazing stuff. Come to my store. I show you things don't exist in the market. <laughs> Good. You. Textile Museum. Museum, Washington, D.C. has amazing collection, yes. LACMA has few rugs, not very much, but they, have, they inherited the rugs from uh, Mr. Getty, John Paul Getty. There's, uh, the, one of the most important rugs, contemporary, was woven in 1538. It's called Ardeville Carpet. Ziegler and Company bought it. Uh, William Morris made uh, Victor and Albert Museum buy that rug for a thousand pounds. Uh, there were two, but they didn't say there were two. So they cannibalized one to fix the first one that is in VNA. And every 10 minutes the light goes on, you can take a picture and see it, and then the light goes off. The second one they sold, the one that missing the main borders, they sold to John Paul Getty, which they donated it to LACMA. Is there? You can see. Um, you mentioned Zoro Zoroastrianism. Yes. I was wondering if you can say a bit more about the strongest influences that Zoro Zoroastrian religion contributed or the culture contributed to these rites. Yes. What are the yes. strongest, most outstanding symbols in your mind? So. Uh, again, I was telling you about religions and what we know about people. Zoroastrianism is actually the first monolithic religion in the world. So he's the one who says there is only one God, whereas before that used to be paganism, shamanism, and they had everybody has his own God at home in the corner, in the closet. They have 5,000 different gods. So Zara, Zaratustra came along and says there is only one God, and he's the sun. That gives us life, gives us uh, warmth, gives us food. That's how it started. And they had three rules, uh, good deed, good talk, and good thoughts. And that actually started with a lot of these rugs, like here, Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda is one of the symbolism of the Zaratustrism, the bote. They have only positive things. And the flower, actually a better world, a idea of paradise comes from there. So it is, predates a lot of current religions. The religions that we have today, they're based on Zoroastrianism. And there is a lot of them living in India nowadays. They, after the Islam conquered Iran, a lot of them moved to India. They call them Parsis. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, they live there. And they are, uh, there are not that many of them, unfortunately, like 50, 60,000 left. Mm -hmm. Is this work? I don't know. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, um, since Iran cherishes its culture so much, I mean, just think of how they cherish their poets, you know, even nowadays that go centuries and centuries back. Yes. Aren't they doing anything to um, keep this art alive? Uh, you know, <laughs> I have to say, unfortunately not. They have different priorities at this point. Uh, Post-revolution, Iran is a no man's land anymore. So used to be the late, um, actually, late Shah of Iran's wife, which is our queen, back then, uh, she started this amazing museum, the Carpet Museum of Tehran, which I have been, it's stunning rugs she collected around the world. But after the revolution, 
there is no, uh, they, it, it's a political thing. So no, they are not doing much to preserve it, unfortunately. If any, we are, they are under sanctions and it just, the bad situation is getting to worse and worse and worse. I had a product, two production lines in Iran. It just so hard to do any business in Iran nowadays. So I, unfortunately, with much losses, I pulled out of Iran and moved our production to India and Nepal. Yeah, no, unfortunately, unfortunately not. And that's actually the birthplace of this art form. And if they don't take care of it, there is a new museum in Baku. They started, there is amazing museum in Doha, the most amazing museum. I think Louvre is probably more comprehensive, but if you want the best of any Islamic art in the world, yes, is in Doha yeah. and amazing. So yeah, they're, they're, these people are doing a little bit for it. Like that rug, the first rug was on there, the Doha bought it. Armenia, no, unfortunately, the financial, they're not that good off, and they have conflict with Azerbaijan. They have, again, different priorities. It's a dying art, and there is not much collecting going around. That is the sad part, and there's not much scholars in this field. And as you have noticed in recent developments, the last 10 years, people are becoming robots. They don't have any feelings left that much. I hate to say this thing because it's going to go on the Internet. But everybody's on their telephone. They're glued. You go to a coffee shop, you're sitting with your friends, you're on the telephone. It's like, what the hell is this, you know? <laughs> it's, I don't get it. People used to collect things. People used to learn things. You used to collect coins, if you remember. You buy a coin, it says it is pre-revolution. You will check the date of a revolution. It comes with the knowledge. You learn something. Why did we have a revolution? You have to inevitably learn something. No, this is not like that. You go to on Instagram, and they have algorithm that they figure who you are, what you are, what you like, and they put every 10 picture you like, one add in there is 20 cents to their pocket, 20 cents to their pocket. And we are losing all this. I love to do this. I used to have uh, juniors of high school come every year to my uh, store. I used to have a little food for them, little drinks, and I used to explain this to them. So they have something they learned. They actually learned a lot. They used to write me letters, thank you so much, we learned something. The lawyers told the school they cannot go out because if a kid falls down, they're gonna sue the school. Or one of them doesn't go back to a school, sell drug, they are reliable, liable for it. What? You know? So these kids become deprived of that. I used to have uh, City College or Santa Barbara City College students come to see us. They're, they put a stop to it. They cannot go out because that's a liability. So everything is going a little bit of the right direction. And the collectors I used to deal with, they're dying off, unfortunately. And there is new people that are not interested in anything except their video games and their telephone, which is very sad. I'm trying to revive that. I'm trying to make sure some younger people get, see something. And this is what I understand. This is what I can teach them, maybe ignite a little bit of passion in them. But that's all I know. There's other fields that it's just all of it is dwindling. Uh, you buy the building, I make it. <laughs> <laughs> I have enough material for a museum. I do have. Um, could we go back? Um, touching that little square there, it's so unbelievably refined. Oh, this? This was probably no, 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 no. Oh. This, the the wool on that. That this one? Yeah. So how do they how do they get it to be so fine? High elevation is not a very fine rug at all. Yeah. The high elevation makes the wool be fine and full of... Okay, so this has a story. So I go to different bazaars. I go to Istanbul Bazaar. I go to Tehran Bazaar. And I'm like a nostalgic. I say, I go check it out. Maybe I find some treasure. Maybe I find something that I have not seen. Uh, I went to Tehran one year, and I went through the whole bazaar. And they want to sell you this, that. And this is cheap. This is good. This is... Uh, I know rugs. So I go, like, okay, yeah, thank you so much, very much. I look at it. I found this. This is the only thing I found from my trip to Tehran. And I bought this just because not to come empty-handed. Yeah. It's not very old, but had that double-headed goat, which I really like. And I bought it. it has, this is a paisley, as you can see. It's a, uh, it's a bote and has a little dog here. So this is what I bought there. And Istanbul, there's nothing old left. So they buy from us. Everything that is old of value followed the money in the last century. They used to go to England and Europe. In the 1900s, they came to the United States because we were the industrial might and we had money. 
So all of it has followed the money came here. A lot of all, all the stuff is in the United States. We are very fortunate we live here. Like any of these, I would not be able to see in Iran. They don't exist unless you go to the museum. You cannot buy it. You cannot see it. It doesn't exist. So I went to the bazaar. I asked, do you guys have anything 15th, 16th, 17th century? They look at me like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking about? So yes, it is a... We are privileged living here. Yeah, that's uh, it. Is okay. Do you know what this is? This is actually a bag. They didn't have Louis Vuitton bags, yeah. so this is a chante. They call it. Used to have a band, and yeah. everyone used to hang and yeah. put their stuff in there. We that's a little bag. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, yes, Ross. Uh, a, thank you so much. And B, it, it seems like what you're saying is that these rugs are messages in a bottle or symbolic photographs from really ancient times. And you've said a lot about the various symbolisms, but I'm most intrigued by the dragons. Is it possible that the dragons were wise people in their culture being depicted as kind of almost cosmic forces but giving something to humans like wisdom, or is that a stretch? Are there messages in these rugs like that, and which ones strike you? Anything you could do with that? So you said about dragons. Actually, I, I go follow dragons. Yeah. So I've been, again, fortunate to be able to travel, and I go every little village, and I talk to a lot of people. Dragons are the one thing, one animal. I mean, forget dogs, but one mm -hmm. animal that binds all of us together, all the cultures. It is amazing. I took a trip last year because they said Kukulkan. I go, what's Kukulkan? It is this huge snake that has wings. I go, you're talking about dragon? <laughs> so I go there to check it out. It's a dragon. I mean, in Mexico, 2,000 years ago, they put a dragon. You could not see they saw the European dragon on Game of Thrones and put it there. They didn't have supposedly any connections to the East, to China. So how did they have that? No, I think dragon actually was probably an alien force. Maybe it was an alien starship. Maybe it was something that is not local here. I mean, this is not far-fetched. I mean, the U.S. Navy sends photos of UFOs they follow. Why not? I mean, this is this one thing I'm chasing, and I'm buying a lot of dragon things. And I actually think this has some merit to it. And yes, wisdom came from them. So... I don't, have you been to uh, Saksawama in Peru? No. You see r stones that are the size of this room. And you cannot put a paper through it. It just shave, cut at top of each other like a puzzle. And I don't think we were able to do that. And this, this is a Peruvian man we are talking about. 1,500 years ago, this is a grown-up man's hat. He was this big. Do you know how many of these Peruvians it takes to move a 500, a thousand ton stone? I don't they think did. they were able to do it. And they had no wheel. They didn't have no wheel. I truly think it was something there. I don't know what. But something there. This guy, thousand of them. <laughs> Ten thousand of them. Not going to move a million pounds. So something there. Yeah, I, I follow the dragon. Dragon is the one that has everybody has it. And there is something to it. And yes, there is wisdom in there. there is, look at this thing. It shows you life. Life is full of uh, paradoxes. It's full of hypocrisy. It's full of beauty. Full of, I would say, div out there. It's just you know, a scary thing to look at. But the whole thing has meanings to it. Yes, they do have meanings. All of them. Uh, speaking of outer space, I'm surprised that none of the rugs that you've shown or, or the symbols that you've shown represent things like the sun and the moon. Oh, they all have sun and the moon in them. Do they? They all. Okay. I mean, that eight-sided star mm -hmm. is from up there. Mm -hmm. They showed most of them are the night sky. You see that one with the dragons? Those are stars. That actually is the sky we are looking at. That's where the dragons and phoenix have a fight. It's all about the sky. It's all about the stars. It's about the sun. All of it. Symbolized. symbolized, yes. 
But you know, like in uh, Tibetan Tonkas, you see an obvious sun and an obvious moon. Yes, I didn't bring any of those, but yes, we have a lot of them. But I'm just saying on these, you, you don't see a sun and moon symbol. Uh, there was on this one. This is the sun. Oh, okay. It's symbolized, stylized. Symbolized, okay. stylized. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. the sun. Yeah. All right. Stand, stand corrected. <laughs> oh, no, they have a lot of it. I didn't bring the right ones for sun and moon. But there is actually another thing about sun and moon as well. Because sun and moon, uh, from like about Ottoman times, became an Islamic uh, symbol. So you see a lot of that in Turkish rugs, you see in tribal rugs, and like the Afshars that they live in southwest Iran, they were actually originally Turkic tribes that they followed the greener postures as the earth got warmer. They followed the posture, not they live in southwest Iran, but they moved with the herd. The herd moved south to greener postures. So those guys are Turkic people, and they have a lot of uh, moon and uh, half crescent and the sun in it. So, so were, were women sort of the traditional carrying of symbols through the generations? In other words, yes. they, they understood the symbols and the meanings and the stories and yes. the mythology and carried that along? That's and what I told you. Women it. are the smart ones. Those are the did all the work. Men, go tend your herd. That's it. They are not. They didn't let them weave actually. So that that was artistic thing women can do. Uh, the, the tribal societies actually, the ancient ones, women are the ones they did all the decisions. In a modern life, unfortunately, a lot of men do the decisions. A lot of politicians. A lot of CEOs are men world would have been a much better place if women run it. Yeah. And I'm totally for it. I mean, just check Angela Mark Merkel. Do you know the chancellor of Germany? Turn that country around. It is the most progressive country. It is, it is a market socialism. Think about it. We don't like that in this country. But it's a market socialism, and they function like a clock. Go to Norway. Go to New Zealand. Since the women take over, country got better. Automatically. Within overnight. So, you know. Talk show, no. Other than dragons, is there any other symbols that we see all around the world? When, you know, like you see it in Peru and then you see oh, yeah, it in... Oh, yeah, well, there is certain signs, like sun you see everywhere, like the moon you see everywhere, okay. the star you see everywhere. Okay. But dragon? Yeah. I mean, you cannot even fantasize about dragon. Mm -hmm. And they are everywhere. I mean... You see them physically. I mean, this is, they carve it in stone. You go to uh, Ukraine, there's dragons. China, everywhere you go is dragon. In Iran, carved is dragon. Everywhere you go is dragons. Caucasus Mountains, full of dragons. Uh, you go to Europe, dragons. Everywhere there are dragons. I have not been to Australia yet. No. Probably they have dragons. They have dragons. <laughs> Thank you. Doctor has a question. Well, well the comment to share with the crowd, while the women are weaving and the kids are around, while, while the women are at home weaving and the children are sitting around, they're not silent. There's oral traditions. They're telling them that they're, as they're weaving and explaining. And this is you know, the, a strong tradition. They didn't have the written language, but oral tradition. And then just the comment of each of these pieces, and it's like that book. Woven from the soul. That's, and, and Michael tried to show that with some of these rugs, the, the story, you know, from the soul. And that's what's the beauty and richness in each of these. Yeah, this is, it, it, they just put actually their spirit in the rug. It is, I feel it. I mean, it's a very interesting thing. I highly recommend you go waste a couple of thousand dollars, buy something really good, hang it on the wall, becomes your best friend. I mean, it's crazy. Like, people come to me, and they have a rug. It's like, I go like, whoa. I'm like an addict. I mean, literally like an addict. I want to see things. I, it just becomes the second nature because it gives you joy, a real joy, because you feel that lady that wove that dragon and phoenix. You just feel her presence. And it brings you happiness, joy. I mean, I, the doctor here the same way. We are both rugaholics. It's... Yeah, well, it's all right. You know, you could be addict to drugs or gambling. It's a lot worse. Believe me, it's a lot worse. Rugs are at least safe. And the good rugs, the good thing about them is they don't get cheaper. 
So up to 15 years ago, the most expensive rug had sold ever was $400,000 in Sotheby's. Then another rug sold for $900,000. Then another rug sold for $2 million. Another rug sold for $9 million. Another rug sold for 20. This one sold for $36 million. I mean, think about it. Within 20 years, from $400,000 to $36 million. And this is auction prices. These people in Doha, they bought rugs that they are way more expensive from private hands. And they are well worth it. If, if a painting goes for $500 million, this is a lot harder to make. Is some of them are a lot rarer. I have a rug in my store. There's three of them around the whole world. I just like, come and check it out. You know, it just... Michelangelo painting, you still can't find, and it's not very rare. You know, go, go to Europe, go to Rome, go to, you know, Milan, go, you know, you look here and there, and there is that. But few of these are very rare and actually impossible to replicate. Impossible to replicate. I think that was nice. Thank you so very much, all of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, I hope you guys didn't get a headache. I hope you take something today. I want to thank Ross and Robert for inviting me. Thank you very much. It was a joy. And smart audience, I really enjoyed it. I was worried it's going to be me, myself, and I. Thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, we do, <laughs> no, I brought my mom. <laughs> before you leave, we do want to give oh, a, yeah. a formal thanks to uh, Michael. But I just want to, before we give that formal thanks, let's just take a few minutes. Just uh, our next programs, um, on uh, February 4th, we have uh, Knowledge and Knowing in Neo-Confucianism, uh, where um, a professor from UCSB will be talking to you about that. And then on the 18th of February, International Politics, Transnational Economics, environmental crisis, ethical and sustainable choices. All that's going to be covered. <laughs> we appreciate your help when, if you could come and do that. But right now, I'd like to ask uh, Joe Miller to give us a, a formal vote of thanks for Michael. Oh, I'm not used to it, but thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it is my great pleasure to offer thanks on behalf of the Institute of World Culture to Michael. Um, there's no question we have all been transformed by the extraordinary tale and story and facts that he has woven here. Uh, he's made a rug out of this entire uh, gathering we've had here. Um, I can tell that I'm transformed because w before, when I walked in here, I would have told you that Michael's wearing a beautiful paisley tie. Oh, yeah. But now, I'm, now I'm leaving knowing that he's wearing a bow tie. Well, okay, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, Thank so you. there's real learning has has occurred. At, I'm remembering in the late '80s there was a Indian photo finisher uh, who had a little shop on Lower State Street, and uh, it was before digital photos. I would bring my my film to him, and he was. Uh, I was wearing a paisley tie that day. I had come off sales. I'm I do draperies, so I'm kind of in the weaving area of things. But he was he was writing up by hand my my um, my photo finishing order, and his eyes kept darting to my tie, as he was writing. And finally, he couldn't help himself anymore. The pen came down in an instant. His arm rushed across, grabbed my tie, and pulled me towards me. He said, don't forget, we gave you this. <laughs> now, now, of course, if Michael was there, he would have argued with him. Because it was, now I've learned it's the Persians, not the Indians. Um, well, you know, um, we, we had these great rains last week. And, and I didn't know why we had those rains, and now I know that the phoenix and the dragon were having a terrific fight. That's it. I think, you know, we've had a rain of wisdom and experience here today, so somewhere on another plane, the dragons and the phoenixes have been fighting. We, we heard so much about symbolism, and, the, you know, I think we all touched what he called the primal level of awareness. Something about all this spoke to us at a level that wasn't merely intellectual, that wasn't merely emotional, that felt like we were going back in time or touching a different level of our past lives. I don't know what it was, but we learned about dragons and dogs and tulips and the ancient cypress tree and the pomegranates and the, the ram's horn, of course, and, and, the, and the play of duality, which we find in all the different cultures. Um, it was just beautiful. The, uh, the Pazyric rug, the, the history of that. It, you know, Michael has curated an experience here that 
that is just uh, extraordinary, bringing together you know, ideas about how these people lived. I mean, bringing into our imagination, yes, that's right, it wasn't a factory, and it was these people, it, it occurred in the midst of their lives. And this great tradition being, being passed along by generations of women, uh, an oral tradition. Um, it's really, it's really extraordinary, and, and I, I realize each rug is really kind of a microcosm. Uh, it, and it brings, these rugs brought together different cultures, you know, uh, it's, it's extraordinary. Each one is reflecting the whole world. This is really what Michael has taught us today. And probably, you know, and I, we're led forward to, to think again, as I was hearing his reflections towards the end about, uh, you know, sort of the tragedy of the loss of the art and the, the way we are living in a digital age of immediate gratification and superficial image. You know, it brings the, the hope within us, the possibility that we would weave together, you know, a better life, that we would learn to weave in the, what our ancestors had learned and what we can't get away. I mean, we're all going to be walking on the ground. That means we have to be walking on something. We might as well walk on beautiful rugs. Um, I would say the most... The I like most, this guy. I like this guy. Beautiful, <laughs> the most beautiful rug of all he didn't you know, that was here today that he didn't mention is a rug called Michael Korish. Himself. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you, thank, thank, you, you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that was actually nice. Next time I have him talk about drugs and I sit down there and watch it. <laughs> Yeah, my mom, my superhero, Shaheen, is right there. She's visiting us actually from Iran, and she's nice, yeah. And my son over there helped me set it up, Kehan, and my niece, Tara. They wanted to come. I got like young people on a seat. That's nice. I didn't have to force them. My daughter is shopping in Los Angeles, though, so. <laughs> she's on her Instagram. <laughs> Anyway, thank you so all for coming. If you guys want to learn this thing, come to the design center and tell me I'm interested to see old rugs. And if you buy it, I get offended. Don't buy my rugs. Come and look at them. I teach you what it is. I have a secret room in there. I have piled up treasures which we don't show to ordinary rug buyers. Come over there. We show you this shit. I am across from the Home Improvement Center, 410 Olive. It's called Santa Barbara Design Center. He has a big gray building, ominous, but okay. we are nice in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Come, look at these, touch them. Oh, all of it. Yes, there are rugs that are made to be on the floor, my dear. Oh, thank you. Good to see you. Yes, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. I'm Michael. Nice meeting. No, please.